Anything you ever did in politics that was useful as far as they brought someone in to? No, usually politics stuff was kind of these grandiose, you know, uh, get into the minds of voters and connect with them and all this. You know, it was kind of like Aaron Rodgers' ayahuasca ceremony. You know, <laughs> I mean, it didn't really go anywhere. I am disappointed because I would think when you're in politics, they would have breakout <laughs> sessions of remaining completely expressionless when your <laughs> candidate says something moronic. Developing the perfect simper for when you <laughs> didn't sit behind the governor and he's signing something you don't like. SNL sketch or maybe an Athens, Wisconsin sketch. Jane comes up with what tutorials you need to be a staffer in the Madison's oh. capital. Moving Wisconsin forward one joke at a time. This is Kristen Bry with As Goes Wisconsin. Yada, yada, yada. Hello, Wisconsin! Hello, Wisconsin. Welcome to the St. Patrick's Day edition of As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. She is Jane Matinair. And what questions do you have about the upcoming spring election? 844-967-2789. Because we are joined by an expert for this segment, for this half hour. Lana Krop is a 12-year veteran of the Wisconsin clerk world. She currently is the city clerk for the city of Lake Geneva and is serving as the secretary for the Wisconsin Municipal Clerks Association. And this upcoming election is going to be her 40th that she's administered in her career. So welcome to As Goes Wisconsin, Lana. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. We're so happy to have you. I think this is, I think you are the first clerk that we've had on the show despite as much as we like talking about voting and elections uh we talked a lot about elections last fall yeah but uh this is your first you're the our inaugural clerk lana <laughs> oh man that's uh that's a tall order to fill oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> so i guess let's start with the let's demystify what city clerks do because, I mean, in Wisconsin, we vote a lot. So I think we keep you guys pretty busy. But just kind of break down with responsibilities with the election, but then also responsibilities outside of elections. Sure. Uh, so there's a lot that we do. Um, us clerks, we're always busy. Uh, elections is a big part of it because, as you guys are aware, Wisconsin is a very interesting state in that our elections are very decentralized and, and the municipal clerks in each municipality, whether you're a town of 200 or a city of 500,000, you're the one in charge of it. Um, so we, you know, we deal with elections, we deal with all of the licensing for our municipalities like liquor and tobacco. How very fitting that, you know, we talk about alcohol on St. Patty's Day. Um, <laughs> I see uh, that you are wearing green, so... Of course, of course. 100%. Had to, had to. Apparently, I'm Irish, but that's oh. what my mom says. So I don't know how accurate that is, so we'll go with it. We'll go with it. Um, what else? We do agendas, minutes, resolutions, ordinances. We're the records custodians for everything for the city. We handle border review. Um, we do a number of things. And then, of course, that all changes depending on your municipality. So what might be my list of duties that I have to do for a city could be vastly different than, say, a town clerk or a village clerk. Interesting. And so how did you find this as a career? Um, it's it's kind of a funny story. So um, back in 2010, I graduated from UW-Whitewater okay. and I was looking for a job. <clears throat> and couldn't find anything. And finally, my mom found an ad for uh, the city of uh, Fort Atkinson looking for a three quarter time receptionist. And I applied for it, got passed over and then actually ended up getting the job. And um, little did I know that when I came into that position, I was actually going to be trained to be uh, come the new deputy clerk, as the current one that was there was retiring. So uh, trained for that, became the deputy clerk, and then became a city clerk in 2014 for the city of Stoughton. And then I made the transition to Lake Geneva here in 2017. There you go. We, it was funny. Did you hear about the drama? This is a side note. This has nothing to do with elections. But have you? Are you? Do you have a, an opinion about the drama of the big mansion that's going to be torn down in Lake Geneva after being bought for seventeen million dollars? Do you have no idea what I'm talking about? I I do, but I just I, I don't, don't really care. have it. No. <laughs> 
Um, well, Lake Geneva, very, very beautiful place. But so I guess uh, with, you mentioned this before, but Wisconsin elections are unique in that mm-hmm. we're very decentralized. So maybe talk a little bit about why that is like most, is it really like true that we're the most decentralized of any state in the union? I don't know if we're the most decentralized. Um, I, I, I apologize. I couldn't answer that question, but I mean, a lot of other states, when you look at the model of how they administer elections, a lot of it takes place at the county level and they have precincts in different areas that are administering the election on behalf of the county. And while we do have county involvement with our elections here in Wisconsin, it's very minimal um, because we are the ones as municipal clerks, we're saying how many ballots we need, who our candidates are because we're the filing officers for our local candidates. Um, We are getting all of our poll workers together. We are getting all of our absentees out. We're entering, entering all of our voter registrations. So we are in charge of our own municipality from start to finish. And so, because when I feel like this only became an issue of people thinking about how decentralized our elections are when in, like no one really thought about it, at least from my perspective until 2020, mm-hmm. because when all of the fast changes of how are we going to conduct an election during a pandemic and because of that decentralized model, so many of the decisions because that's the way the model is, we're left up to individual clerks and individual offices, correct? Yes. And, and thus, the the criticism came of that model. And so what has been kind of since 2020, when y'all's job has been under a microscope and uh, the amount of outsized attention and ridicule you've all been under, which is not deserved, has definitely been there. But as far as what has life been kind of pre and post the 2020 election when it comes to being a city clerk? So, you know, I I have to say I'm very fortunate in the community in which I serve that everybody is very appreciative Um, everybody comes in, you know, whether it's the staff or the electors or just the general guests of our city, everybody's been very respectful and very kind. And they're very understanding of the hard work that we do. Um, and that's not the case in all municipalities. So I feel, I really feel for those other clerks, um, because it is a hard job and it's, it's, it's difficult sometimes to kind of stay out of the limelight and, and come under fire. But, um, you know, prior to 2020, we, you know, we talked about 2012 being like the uh, election year, because if anybody remembers 2012 was the year of six elections. It was a lot. We had a lot. What happened in 2012? I wasn't living here. So in 2012, we had the, our four, standard elections like we yeah. normally have in an even numbered year but then we also had the recall elections for oh, governor yeah. walker so we had a february primary we had an april spring election we had a may recall primary we had a june recall election we had an august partisan primary and then we had the november general election which was the was the presidential year so that was mitt romney yeah. versus obama mm-hmm. Oh my God. <laughs> it was a big year. So like when we got done with 2012 and moved, moved past it, we were like, Oh, we never want to do that again uh, because it was just, it was a lot. Like you yeah. were barely getting done with one election before you were starting another one. Um, so there was a lot of hard deadlines. And then we moved into 2016, which number of elections was pretty standard for an even numbered year. But then we had the presidential recount and that added a whole nother level to clerks and what was going on and kind of explaining the different facets and, and methods and um, procedures that we follow when it comes to election. And then we hit 2020. <laughs> and I, 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 we always joke that like, if we could handle 2020 the way we did, um, we can handle anything yeah. because it was such an interesting year, not just because we were in the pandemic, because, but also because of the political climate as yeah. well. So it was an interesting year, to say the least. Um, at times, it was very trying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you're still here. You didn't quit. I didn't. <laughs> um, clerk's mental health has now, as and, and it may sound silly, um, but it's really becoming 
in the forefront of what we are discussing as a municipal um, clerk's board, our professional organization. Because after 2020, we saw a lot of clerks leave. A lot. Because it was so trying and so difficult. So we're seeing you know, clerks are burnt out, they're stressed out. Um, And then we have new people coming in that have no idea, um, you know, and it's not their fault, but they just don't know how much is involved with elections. And then every other facet of the job, because just because you have an election doesn't mean that we're not posting agendas and getting stuff done on the other end. We can't stop. Um, So we're really worried. We're really focusing on clerks well-beings and having mentor clerks available for new clerks and it's 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 a little bit of a shift of how it used to be back in the the old days as i'll say the old days the old, well it doesn't sound like necessarily it's like every couple years it's been like every four years it's basically been like oh my gosh how do we get through that <laughs> so here's fingers crossed that 2024 is not as crazy <laughs> I guess we'll just have to see. I mean, you know, when it comes to like the election stuff and the procedures and the rules, we're good there. It's kind of the other outside stuff that's going to get thrown at us that we're like, "Mm, okay, let's see how let's see how this goes. Yeah. Which when we come back from the break, I, you know, this is a state that loves to have um, court rulings come down basically up until the deadline of all of you trying to get ballots out. So there's that challenge. Uh, But also, I think just having a conversation of what changes have happened since 2020 uh, that were good or bad. And you don't have to say the opinion, but just kind of what people should know about our elections right now and also what people should know for the election that is coming up on April 4th. Uh, Our guest is Lana Kropp, who is a 12-year veteran of the Wisconsin clerk world and currently serves as the city clerk of the city of Lake Geneva. We will be right back. This is As Goes Wisconsin. Missed your favorite show live on air? It's easy to find what you enjoy wherever you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts. And we're always streaming on TuneIn and the Civic Media app. Max Inc. Radio with Dennis Graham from Rock Onsen. Appreciate all the support of, uh, of Mad Radio 92.7. By the way, a tip of the hat to Civic Media. That was a great article on the Cap Times by Paul Fanlin. You guys got a great model that you're growing around the state, uh, local interest uh, with uh, radio stations uh, throughout these different markets. And uh, a tip of the hat, and you're focusing on local music and nobody's doing it. So great job. Listen to Max Inc. Radio Saturday night, 6 to midnight on the Civic Media Radio Network. Hey there, fellow working class heroes. I'm Rick Smith, host of The Rick Smith Show. And we are now on the air in Waukesha, live weeknights, 8 to 10 p.m. right here on WAUK 540 AM, 101 FM, The Shaw. Turn on, tune in, and help us rebuild the American dream. Check out our website at thericksmithshow.com. The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk. Weeknights, 8 to 10 p.m. right here on WAUK 540 AM, 101 FM, The Shaw. Weather on this snowy day in Milwaukee could be brought to us by your pizza delivery business. Can you imagine how many families are snuggled in their homes enjoying hot, tasty pizza? Weather makes the phone ring for just $199 per week. Call us at 608-819-8255. Here's your updated forecast on the Shaw. Daytime highs approaching 31 this afternoon under overcast skies. Westerly winds 20 to 25 miles an hour. Lows dip down to about 13 tonight. Cloudy skies expected. Cloudy skies expected again tomorrow. High temperatures reach up to 25. Ample sunshine expected Sunday with daytime highs approaching 39. 
46 Monday. For Civic Media, I'm meteorologist Eric Hike. Currently, it's 27 degrees. The Shaw 101 FM, your fix for progressive talk from Big Bend to Menominee Falls. Always streaming at WAUKradio.com. So many songs about voting. <laughs> Gotta get you into that booth, into that booth. <laughs> Welcome back to As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. She is Jane Matinair, and we are talking to Lana Crop, who is a 12-year veteran of the Wisconsin clerk world, and she is currently the city clerk for the city of Lake Geneva. And we are talking to her about being a city clerk, what that means, and also uh, elections in general, because we have one coming up in 18. Would you say it's so when you do the countdown, Lana, for how many days we have until the election, do you include election day? Or is it up until election day? So how many days would you say we have until the election? So I I'm sorry, I'm looking up at my calendar. Uh, I would say include election day. So would that be 19 days then? You're going to make me do math right now? I oh, know. my gosh. This, like, well, this has been a debate with us and one of the other talk show hosts on this channel. Because we he has, his show was the day after, or the hour after mine. And in the fall, I kept saying one day less than he was saying on his show. Okay. And so because I was like, no, it's the day you count until the day. He's like, no, you count the day because you can vote until the end of the day. And I was like, so I was, I was going to your official opinion on how you feel about that. She just wanted to win. <laughs> That's true, too. So I think, um, I mean, if I had to look at it from that aspect, uh, so 20 days prior to the election is the last day that you can register to vote online or through the mail. And that was the end of the day on the 15th. Okay. So there you go. Good to know. There you go. (laughs) All right. So I think I do want to get into everything people should know and remember dates, deadlines for April 4th, but also with the tumultuousness of the 2020 election. We've obviously had a big election since then. We had a huge turnout in the fall mm-hmm. and seemingly without any drama. Um, mm-hmm. Right. And, yeah. and so as far as things that stayed the same, things that changed, welcome changes that happened coming out of like, was, was there lessons out of 2020 that you felt like got addressed and got adopted into how we're doing elections two years out, two plus years? Hmm. I mean, I know that we had uh, changes when it came to how people could return their absentee ballots. Um, And that's kind of the biggest thing that's standing out in my mind. So um, prior to 2020 and even during 2020, um, you could use a drop box at your municipality to drop off your absentee ballot. That is not the case anymore. Um, And you could have say a spouse or, um, you know, a family member or friend drop off a absentee ballot for you as long as it was completed with all the necessary information. And that's no longer the case either, unless there are certain circumstances um, due to uh, physical ability to do so. So um, those are the biggest changes that I can remember coming out of 2020. Um, And I mean, I don't really have an opinion on them either yeah. way. Uh, you know, we are a steward to the lawmakers and to the election law and whatever, whatever we need to do, we will do within the letter of the law. Yeah, no, totally. And I think it's just because, like I said, it's sometimes hard for the average person. Like I follow this stuff really closely because I talk about it. But for mm-hmm. the average person to stay up to date with what they can or when they're just trying to vote. Because there's so many dates, you know, even being able to say early voting starts March 21st, but it doesn't start everywhere March 21st because not everywhere has early voting. And so, like, the the struggle to get accurate, up-to-date information out to voters can be a struggle. And that's, that's it's not even, you know, I just took this on and I'm trying, let alone for what you guys try to do as far as getting accurate information out that can be different depending on because it is so decentralized. And so just trying to get... While you're here, get you to say, uh, to tell us what has been changed so more people can be aware. But then I guess also while you're here, what should people know leading up to April 4th in the 
days that we have left. The days. Yeah, the countdown is on. Um, so, you know, a couple of things. If your municipality has a website, always check the website. Uh, we always try to keep um, dates and information regarding upcoming elections um, on our website. If not, you can always go to myvote.wi.gov and you can look um, You can look up your name and your date of birth and figure out what's on your ballot. You can find your clerk's information. Um, and a lot of times we input when we start in-person absentee voting. Um, we are required by law to publish notices when it comes to election two in our, our official newspaper. So here in the city of Lake Geneva, you can always check the Lake Geneva Regional News um, and they'll have it posted in there. Um, and the other thing is you can always give us a call um, or shoot us an email. Um, the more that we can inform our voters and and give everybody the information, uh, the better, um, because as much as you would like to hope and rely on other sources to report the correct information, sometimes it's just better to hear it from the horse's mouth, as it were. So give us a call. All right. That is good to know. Give, give them a call. And I guess and the last question is, what could the average voter do to make your guys' life easier? Oh. Oh. Uh <laughs> Can we bring you guys snacks or something? Is it just I be just... nice to you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I, that is a big part of it is, you know, the understanding, again, like I said, that we are stewards to the law. So it isn't us, you know, as individuals that are that are making these changes. Um, we are doing everything within statute that we are able to do. So there are certain things that we can and that we used to be able to do and that we just can't anymore, or that we are now able to do that we weren't able to do before. So, um, you know, the, the, just the good job. Thank you so much. Um, and the understanding that goes a long way. If we know that we're making your lives easier and that you're happy with how we are running things and how things are going for you, that's what matters to us. That is a great answer. That is a wonderful answer. You're saying understanding and empathy goes a long way? No. It does. You know, what a crazy <laughs> concept, right? All right. Lana Crop is the city clerk for the city of Lake Geneva. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Good luck with the election. And uh, I'm sure we'll have you back to give us more voting information in the future. I would love it. Thank you so much for having me. Happy St. Right. Patty's Day. You too. All right. We'll be back in a minute. This is As Goes Wisconsin. WAUK 540 AM, Franklin's Choice for News Talk Radio. Streaming 24 7 at WAUKradio.com. CBS News briefed the Biden administration with a new push today after the recent bank failures. White House correspondent Nancy Cordes. The president says increasing accountability for bank managers is the best way to prevent mismanagement in the future. So today he's asking Congress to give bank regulators new powers to impose fines and claw back compensation from bank managers when their banks fail. The U.S. also expressing concern today about the upcoming meeting between China's President Xi and Vladimir Putin. And as we hear from CBS's Cammie McCormick, the International Criminal Court has issued an arrest warrant for the Russian president. The court says this warrant is because of Putin's alleged involvement in abductions of children from Ukraine. It calls it an unlawful deportation, and he bears the responsibility for the war crime. Russia, which has denied atrocities since the war in Ukraine began, called the action meaningless. CBS News Brief. I'm Steve Kathan. The Shaw 101 FM, New Berlin's choice for news talk radio. Streaming 24-7 at WAUKradio.com. For Civic Media, I'm Jane Matnair. Here's what you need to know. Helping smaller communities that depend on private wells and groundwater is the aim of a new measure introduced this week by Wisconsin Senator Tammy Baldwin. The Healthy H2O Act will provide grants for water testing and help in purchasing systems to remove or significantly reduce the levels of PFAS. The so-called forever chemicals are increasingly being found in wells in Wisconsin and across the country. Wisconsin Supreme Court Chief Justice Annette Ziegler will continue at that post for a 
second two-year term after being re-elected in private by her fellow justices this week. The court did not release a vote breakdown. On the court since 2007, Ziegler is part of the four-justice conservative majority. On April 4th, voters will choose between liberal judge Janet Protasiewicz and conservative former Justice Daniel Kelly. I'm Jane Matnair. This is Civic Media News. Hey everybody, how we doing? I'm Charlie Barons inviting you to join me Saturdays and or Sundays at noon. It's a horse apiece, whatever you decide. Uh, we're doing the Cripes cast where we talk to people for and or from the Midwest. And it's more fun than a six pack of Jolly Good. Okay, the pride of Random Lake that Jolly Good is. Anyway, it's on your Civic Media station and the Civic Media app. And do me a favor, yeah, tell your folks I says hi. Okay, real good. It's the Mad City Brido Expo, Sunday, March 26th at the Monona Terrace in Madison. Imagine planning your wedding in just one day. Pre-register for tickets at madcitybridoexpo.com and receive a $200 gift card. Tickets are also available at the door for $10. Read all the Hi, Helen. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. I can't see you. Can you see me? Uh um, well, I have a, so right now it should say we're on a commercial break. So I have that up during the breaks, but I, I can't, I don't, I don't know if your camera's on. It's all black for me, but I can hear you. Right. So that's the most important part. I can stop, but how do I get this camera to connect? <laughs> well, let's see here. Maybe this will do it. Oh, there, we oh, are. there you are. There you are. Great. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. I'm like, oh, I have nothing. So um, we're definitely, we'll start with the uh, story as far as, how uh, the Promise program is expanding. Um, so we'll just talk about that, how it's been working, why it's important. I don't know. I know you, oh, we have to wrap up. We'll be back in a minute, but it's a, it'll be about 15 minutes. We'll break at 1248. I just, I can't explain it. When your kid can't find the language, find the lyrics. Start a conversation at sounditouttogether.org. Brought to you by Ed Council and Pivotal Ventures. There was a time in my life that I felt so all alone That I never thought that someday I would have a happy home A family and a four-track radio shack microphones A backyard and a hammock and a paid-off student loan a backyard and a hammock and a paid-off student loan So if you see me Welcome back to As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. She is Jane Matinaire. I want, I'm going to, we're going to introduce our next guest in just a minute, but some breaking news we will get to in the next segment. But J.R. Ross from Wisp Politics just reported that Doug LaFollette has is retiring and Evers is going to appoint Sarah Godlewski. Secretary of State. Secretary of State. So, yeah, so that is um, he's been in office for a very long time. A really, really, really a long very time. long time. So we'll talk about that more in the next segment because I don't want to steal any time away from our next guest. But we have talked about student loans a lot. We have talked about. How to encourage more. Wisconsinites to go to college, to be able to afford to go to college, the different programs that both the UW system, but also the Wisconsin technical college system is trying to do to make school more accessible and affordable and higher education more accessible and affordable for more people. So here to talk about the Bucky Pell's uh, program and the uh, Wisconsin Promise program is Helen Faith, who is a UW, uh, at, at UW-Madison as the director of the Office of Student Financial Aid. Welcome to the show, Helen. Thank you so much for having me, Kristen. So the original, because I know that there's also a debate right now happening on how to expand what is re really only been at uh, UW-Madison so far, but this tuition promise program that covers the last mile of low lower income, so $62,000 or less that the family makes for students going to Madison, paying off that last mile after Pell Grants, after other scholarships. Mm -hmm. And so far, Madison is really the first school to do this, right? Absolutely. The first school in Wisconsin. I can't say we're the first school. Yeah, in sorry. In the uh, UW system. Absolutely. The first school in the UW system to offer this. And so this was developed, um, you know, as you mentioned, it's been in, in place for a few years now. We have Bucky's Tuition Promise, which was introduced in the 2018-19 academic year. And we now have our fifth class um, benefiting from this program. And we graduated our first class last spring of freshmen who came in in the first year. So that's very, very exciting. And we really built this program to be as simple and clear as possible. Um, and so it was really built around what is the state's median household income? 
And can we ensure that all students coming from a household income at the median or below can afford to go to UW-Madison and make that messaging as simple as possible? And so um, it was launched in 1819 with that, you know, you just have to meet the AGI threshold. If you're mm -hmm. at that combined household adjusted gross income or below, you can qualify to go to UW-Madison for free for four years as a freshman or for two years as a transfer student. Um, even if things change in future years, as long as you qualify in that first year, we guarantee that to you for the whole period of time. Um, and so we're really excited that the UW system has, um, you know, has caught the bug and has decided yeah. that this is something worth doing for the whole state, um, for the whole system. And so uh, they have similarly set a threshold for household income and they'll be making that promise to students again for two years for transfers and for four years for um, for incoming freshmen. Um, it's a little bit different in that, you know, their their income threshold is set at $62,000 and um, our income threshold will be moving from sixty dollars to $65,000 this okay. coming fall. So okay. some little nuances, right? Yeah. Um, this is funded through the system. Ours is funded through private donations and private resources. Um, and so there's some differences there as well. Um, so those are kind of the the, the major differences between the two programs. Um, and then starting this fall, we're really excited to be able to announce that we've decided to expand further, um, realizing that tuition and fees are a huge part of the overall cost of going to college and the thing that most people understand to be the major cost of going to college, um, but that there are a lot of other costs involved as well, mm -hmm. right? And so if you have your tuition and fees covered, that's great, but what if you don't have your rent covered? What if you can't afford to pay for your meal plan? What if you can't afford your books, right? And so we've been working for a number of years to really expand affordability. Um, Bucky's Pell Pathway is our new program that makes it very clear that not only do you have your tuition and fees covered, but we'll also ensure that your full financial need is covered. Financial need is kind of a tricky concept. Um, I mean, but, that was, I just, even right now, because so, so is there two, is there two different names? Yes, um, there are two Bucky's different Pell. programs that are very, that are similar, they're very aligned, but they're not exactly the same, right? And they, okay. they don't necessarily always serve the exact same students, but there's a huge amount of overlap. Um, both programs are for Wisconsin residents um, and they are applicable in the first term that you uh, enter UW-Madison, either as a freshman or a transfer student. That's when we determine your eligibility. Uh, Bucky's Pell Pathway, again, it meets full financial need, which I, I realize is a trickier topic, a trippier, trickier concept to communicate to students and families. But in essence, your cost of attendance is something that every school calculates and it includes your tuition and fees, but it also includes those other costs that I was talking about. So it includes your house your meals. It includes transportation, you know, to and from school during the school year, to and from home during the breaks. Um, it includes uh, personal expenses and your books and other course materials. So we build a cost of attendance that includes all of those costs on top of tuition. And so, you know, whereas tuition and fees for a Wisconsin resident for the upcoming year um, will be 10798 is the current estimate. Um, the total cost of attendance, once you add in all those additional costs, is 28498 So there's quite a difference difference between those two. Mm -hmm. Uh, financial need is just the difference between that cost of attendance and when a student applies for financial aid, what that expected family contribution is. So that's where it gets a little bit more tricky. And that's why with Bucky's tuition promise, we really kept it around AGI because virtually anybody on the street, if you stop them and you say, hey, is your adjusted gross income under $65,000 or over? Most people can probably answer that pretty quickly. Yep. Whereas most folks probably would have no idea what their expected family contribution might be <laughs> based on yes. that. Right. We're talking to Helen Faith, who is the director of the Office of Student Financial Aid at UW-Madison. And I think it's, when it comes to it, hearing the programs that are available, it's right. great. Mm -hmm. How hard is it to get the information to the people to even, when they're applying? Because I would imagine that a lot of people who are eligible for either program, both programs, um, maybe first time, first generation college students. Right. So their parents' ability to navigate the system of getting into college, let alone the financial and scholar, all the scholarship money. And so the web of information and the different names and the different eligibility. Oh, and so it it's, yeah, it's a lot of information and for, for not only for teenagers, but even for adults. And so how much of the challenge is it? It's one thing to get the programs up and running. Right. It's another thing to get the information to the people who need it. And so how Absolutely. does that get distributed? 
That's a great question. You know, sometimes through outlets like this, right? Um, by yeah. <laughs> various news stories, whether it's on, you know, on television or on the radio or in press, um, on, online. So lots of information goes out that way. We also work really closely with lots of schools um, across the state um, to get the word out. And, um, and we try to partner as much as we can with various organizations to, again, help to support that message. Um, so, you know, we go and we do presentations we communicate with the high school counselors um, and just really try to, again, keeping the message simple, I think is really key. Um, because, you know, if you can, if you can tell somebody what this program is in an elevator speech, and they can remember that and pass that on to the next person, so much does happen through word of mouth, um, through family connections, through friends. Um, I, and I think a perfect illustration of how that simple messaging and that um, kind of constant sort of drip campaign of getting that information out to folks who were involved in in post sec in rather k through 12 is so important is when i was at my own uh, middle schoolers completion ceremony in uh, last spring somebody stood up and was talking about the importance of going to college and how you know as these students are going to high school they should be planning for that and he said and you know bucky's tuition promise is there for families making under the income threshold at the time was sixty thousand yeah. dollars it was like this person was planted there right and yet yeah kept your, your, your ears perk up like did they know I was, what I'm, I was, yeah. this is I'm so proud of us and I'm so proud of the state for moving that direction the UW system um, but it was great to hear that you know again it's that clear and simple messaging and being really consistent about it um, the fact that we make that guarantee to families on the front end you know that this is something we're going to do for you for four years even if your income changes we've made this commitment that commitment stands for four years similarly to the Pell Pathway Families need predictability. Students need predictability in their financial aid. They need to not have to worry every single year and they need it to be simple. So we don't require students to do anything extra beyond just, you know, applying to college and applying for financial aid as they normally do. There's nothing extra that we require them to jump through to get there. Um, and, you know, another key element of Bucky's Pell pathway is that it's a, it's a pathway to allow for debt-free college. Right. It's not necessarily a promise and the students could still choose to take loans, but we try to meet their financial need in such a way with grants and scholarships and work study awards um, that, you know, as long as they have a family contribution coming in or perhaps they have zero contribution required, um, that full cost is covered. So they don't need to borrow loans to attend UW-Madison necessarily. Our hope is that they can get through school debt free. Um, and if they do have to borrow, that that's as minimal as possible. And again, I think that messaging is important too. Many students, have, particularly those students who come from you know, less affluent households are gonna be really concerned about taking on student loans, uh, especially given the national discourse around student loans. Yeah. Um, and we don't want that to be a worry. We don't want that to be a deterrent for students who are capable of benefiting from an education here at UW-Madison. Helen, I think sometimes that some of the applications and all the paperwork that you have to fill out can be really daunting for people. Yes. Is there like an application tutor that can help people <laughs> get through these things? I, I can't say that I'm an expert in all the different channels involved in applying to yeah. college, applying to all of the different um, types of financial aid that students might receive. Um, I think the best that we can do you know, from where we sit is to use existing structures and not require extra steps. Right. And so students can apply to UW Madison um, through different admissions channels, either the, you know, if they want to use the common application because they're using that for a huge number of schools, they can use that. If they want to use the UW system application, they can use that if they're only applying to UW system schools. So to give them options and keep it as simple as possible. Similarly for financial aid, all they have to do is file the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid. They do have to do that every year, um, but there is no supplemental ad application. There's no additional essay that we require for this. Um, we, we, again, try to keep it simple. We don't want to add additional barriers. We just want to make sure that students know that UW-Madison is committed to making this an affordable option for you. We want you to come. Um, we have so many talented students in the state of Wisconsin from every county, and we want to welcome them all. So since the program's been, it started in 2018, so it's been a couple years. There's mm -hmm. been one graduating class. Have you seen an uptick in a shifting demographic or what have some, what have like in those five going on five years, um, what has been some of the changes or that you've seen in the student body of the people who are benefiting from the program? 
You know, that's a that's a great question. I think you know what we're what we're hoping that we'll see is an increasing number of Wisconsin residents um, from you know median and lower income households um, coming to UW Madison and realizing that there aren't barriers in front of them. And I think there's certainly what I've observed is a consciousness throughout the state. Apologies for my ability to turn this off, but a greater consciousness that really does seem to permeate the state around that affordability. Um, you know, beyond that, you know, I I will run into people really all, sometimes when I'm traveling out of state even, and they say, oh, you're from UW-Madison. Um, my sister went to UW-Madison and she received Bucky's tuition promise and it made a huge difference. Um, oh, wow. In many ways, like when we first started the program, it didn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily that we were giving that much more money necessarily per student, but it was the clarity of what we were providing, right? Yeah. We might've increased awards, but the more important thing was the simple messaging for families that this covers your full tuition. We would have students whose sisters would call them, brothers would call them to say, hey, I heard you got into UW Medicine. Did you hear about this program that was just publicized? Oh. But where they might not have otherwise put the pieces together that this covers full tuition and fees. They might not have read the letter um, necessarily that explained that to them. The fact is that it, because it hit the, the airwaves in the way it did, um, it really helped to build that consciousness so that whole families and communities could support each other in that. You still got to get in, though. You still got to get in to UW Madison, which is still a hard thing to do. It is a very good school. <laughs> it's an excellent school, and we don't want to close the doors to anybody who's qualified to attend, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, is there anything else that people should know before we let you go for today, Helen? Uh, just that we are, you know, we're here to support you. If you ever have any questions, please reach out to us. Um, we're absolutely committed to making UW Madison an affordable and wonderful option for you. Absolutely. All right. Well, Helen Faith is the director of the Office of Student Financial Aid at UW-Madison. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you. I really, really appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. When we come back, we'll talk more about that breaking news about Doug LaFollette and do our weekly headline quiz. This is As Goes Wisconsin. When I was a kid, we would play Annie at recess. I was always sandy because I was the smallest. From all that crawling on the black top, there were holes in all my jeans, in the toes of my boat shoes, but I never complained because I didn't think that I could sing. See, I never perfected that nasally thing, the way all the kids sang in the school play. Now I know it's better if we don't all sound the same. Now I know it's better if we don't all sound the same. So if you hear me, and I'm screaming about... Up North News Radio is Wisconsin's new choice for progressive talk about important state issues from the team that brings you the news through social media, newsletters, and here on the radio. I'm Pat Kreitlow. Join me weekday mornings from 6 to 8 a.m. Earl Ingram. They can't tell you one thing that Ron Johnson has done to support them. I don't understand that. I never will understand it. I know we've got conservative listeners, but I asked them to point to one thing that Ron Johnson has done to make their lives any better. And they can't point to any of it. Conversations that hit home every day. The Earl Ingram Show. Weekday mornings 8 to 11 on Civic Media and on the Civic Media app. I'm Chris Jackmick. I served in the United States Air Force and I deployed three times. So in 2017, I was serving as an Air Force First Sergeant. Our motto in that role is my job is people, everyone is my business. But unfortunately in that year, I would lose my own brother, Lance Corporal Adam Jackmick, to suicide. The majority of veteran suicides are from guns. I store my weapons securely, not only for myself, but for my family. Store all your guns securely, help stop suicide. My service never stops. Brought to you by N Family Fire and the Ad Council. Weather on this snowy, snowy day could be brought to us by your business. Can you imagine how many snowblowers, snow shovels, and snowmobiles are being sold as we speak? Weather sponsorships make the phone ring. Call us at 608-819-8255. Here's your updated forecast on the Shaw. Cloudy skies this afternoon with highs around 31. Winds out of the west, 20 to 25 miles an hour. Cloudy skies expected again tonight. Lowest dip down to about 13. Cloudy skies expected tomorrow. Daytime highs approaching 25. Dry and turning much warmer Sunday and Monday with highs from the upper 30s to the mid 40s. 
For Civic Media, I'm meteorologist Eric Height. Currently, it's 27 degrees. A progressive voice from Beaver Dam to Kenosha. WAUK 540 AM. Always streaming at WAUKradio.com. When you're a jet, you're a jet. All the way from your first cigarette to your last dying day. When you're a jet, if the spit hits the fan, you got brothers around. You're a family man. You're never alone. You're never disconnected. You're home with your own. When companies expected, you're well protected. Then you Welcome see. back to As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. She is Jane Madnair. I'm missing the connection. Stephen Sondheim. Ah. You had a note about Stephen Sondheim. I did. I did have a note about Stephen Sondheim. I didn't know where I was going to sneak it in. But um, despite he did die in 2021 at 91, one of my favorite all-time musical theater contributors. Did a lot of work. Did a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Wrote a lot of really good lyrics. Yeah. Uh, But his final musical is going to premiere off-Broadway in September. And so it is called uh, Here We Are. It's going to make its off-Broadway world premiere this fall with Joe Monte- uh, Mantello directing. Oh, wow. And uh, I don't know much beyond that, but the director has won the Tony two times. Formerly known as Square One, the music, the final musical composed by Sondheim before his death in 2021 will be staged at The Shed. And that's kind of all the information there is. All right. So he wrote the lyrics to the Jet song from West Side Story. Yeah. And he did not write the music, but he, no, wrote, but he yeah. wrote the lyrics. And so um, I didn't know we were going to talk about that. So I just funny. wanted to throw, <laughs> I love that song. See, that's the song that I used to dance around in my room. And I was the Sharks and the Jets. And I did everybody. Oh, yeah. So I can say, I can, I know all the lyrics to that song. I do most of the lyrics to that entire soundtrack, I would say. It's crazy how lyrics stick with you like that. Definitely. Same thing with Into the Woods. Like if you put on Into the Woods, I probably know most of the lyrics. Um, anyway, anyway, so we'll see how much time we have to, if we want to do both, but Doug LaFollette retiring. He's been there. Oh, he's been there since 78, I think. 78. So basically he's, he only, so LaFollette, no, 74. Wow. LaFollette was first elected as secretary of state in 1974. And he served a single term before mounting an unsuccessful challenge to be lieutenant governor. Ah. So then he went back and ran for Secretary of State again in 1982, and he has been the Secretary of State since. And that means through Republican sweeps, all the, you know, the Walker years, the Tommy Thompson years, the years that, like, Republicans did very well in the election, Doug Follett still won year after year after year, including as recent as last fall. Yeah, he just got reelected. He just got reelected. And that's why this is a little this is a little sneaky. <laughs> Cuz he had well, he had a challenger. The I think it's um I can't remember I'm forgetting her name, but it was the leader of the Dane County Democratic Party primaried him and lost. But I remember cuz I did a video about this last year because the woman who was chall- the Republican who challenged him in the in the general was I'm not going to say a straight up election denier, but embraced the idea. You know, had some questions about our election integrity, and you know, similar to other states where had Republicans won, the governor had Tim Michaels won, had the woman who was running for Secretary of State won, had there been more of a Republican sweep, they were going to restore a lot of the responsibilities that have been stripped from the secretary of state to put a lot more power back in the hands of one person to be controlling our elections. And so it was kind of this conundrum or this, this catch, I don't know if catch 22 is the right word, but to have someone challenging Doug LaFollette, who's basically been unbeatable for decades, for decades, even though his job, what his role has become is, it's been so stripped it's down. It's like he basically protects the state seal. And that's... Because there's a lot of threats towards the state yes. seal. Yes. So, you know, so it's not like there's a lot going on in that job, but there was at the risk of had his challenger beat him in the primary, 
she had a lot less name recognition than he does. Definitely. So then you you create a situation where she may not be able to beat the Republican, despite the fact that he's proven that he can beat Republicans for so long. And it was like this whole thing. So now to have him basically just win so that he can step down is a little like, ah. And 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 give Governor Evers the appointment. Yes. And, uh, you know, and then like, I, we, Sarah Godlewski, friend of the show yeah. and everything. But it, it, see that a little bit is like, oh, you literally just ran so you could retire and someone, then someone else can get appointed for the next four years I, before they have to run again. All they are doing is following the Supreme Court appointment playbook of Mitch McConnell. I have no problem with this whatsoever. Good. None. I don't have a problem. I'm not going to lose sleep over it, but I raise an eyebrow. <laughs> he is like 84, though. It's it's, it's time. time. It's time. Him and his his sun hat that he wears everywhere. But yeah, I mean, it's uh... and you got to give him props for for being a public servant. For, oh for yeah, all of these decades in in what is arguably one of the least sexy jobs. In state government. I know. He's 82. Sorry, I missed 82. Didn't want to take two years away from him. But uh, 82, Doug LaFollette is retiring. Sarah Godlewski will step in. Well, well, and so she'll also just, she'll probably still be able. I, w- I wonder if what she'll have to do with Women Win Wisconsin. Can you still be running a pack if you are in office? I mean, I guess I, she was technically still sec- uh, state uh, treasurer when she started women win, win Wisconsin in the fall because just because she was running for Senate doesn't mean she didn't still have her elected position. We'll have to have her back on because she was just on a couple of yeah, weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they're they still doing the rallies and everything. So I don't know what the conflict, if there is any conflict there as far as running an organization like that while still holding office. See, and now I want the next time that we get to have her on the show, I want her to come in so she can bring the state seal. <laughs> It'll be very exciting. Take pictures with it. Oh, Make it our profile picture across is. every my new LinkedIn picture. Oh, <laughs> it'll it'll be huge. All right. Well, that will do it for any serious parts of today's show. Well, that's not true. We're gonna have fun in the next hour. We're gonna do a lot of St. Patrick's Day topics, maybe tell you some facts you didn't know about St. Patrick's Day. Some surprising stuff. Maybe some uh we'll hear from some of you of how you celebrate St. Patrick's Day, even if you're not Irish. But also a conversation around making fun of swaths, making fun of the Irish for certain tropes, but also making fun of Wisconsin for super some tropes and who gets to do it and can you do it as long as you do it well. We'll have a conversation about that all coming up in the next hour. Stay tuned. This is As Goes Wisconsin. More soon. You're the top cat in town.